Hello and welcome to Analog Insights. In today's episode of Talking Cameras, I'm sitting down with Lee A. Johnson. The British-born programmer and photographer lives in a tiny ski village in the Swiss Alps. There he captures beautiful mountain scenes with his Hasselblad X-Bahn, um, works on reportages and long-term projects with his Hasselblad camera and is out and about with his 4x5 inch Toyo Field. Lee has started working on a couple of long-term projects that I find particularly striking and um, overall fantastic. And just to mention one example, he traveled four times to Monaco, the, the, the famous Formula One racetrack, to capture what is happening around these Formula One racetracks for his series Formula None. And of course, he will tell us all about it in a minute. Lee has been published online and in magazines and has self-published a couple of projects and he um, has had exhibitions and sells prints online and at a local gallery. Let's dive in there to take a closer look at his cameras of course but also his approach as a photographer. So hi Lee, thank you very much for joining the show today, uh, this episode of Talking Cameras. Um, the audience heard a brief introduction of um, who you are and what you're doing and nevertheless it would be super interesting to hear it in your own words. So who are you and what do you do as a photographer? Uh, well hi Max, yeah thanks for, for having me on the, the show. Um, yeah as you said I'm, I'm originally from the UK, uh, I moved out to Switzerland almost a decade ago, which is quite scary. It feels like it's five minutes, not 10 years, but that's, that's the way it works. Right. And yeah, I've been, I've been into photography for, uh, what is it now? 20, over 20 years, I guess. So I kind of, I got into it when film was still a common thing, you know, digital was just starting to get interesting and available and a bit cheaper, but I kind of got into the the film side of things, um, did some darkroom classes, set up my own little darkroom at home, um, and I took it from there. What kind of got me into it was skateboarding because I was skating a lot of the time and I was never that great a skateboarder. So I wanted to get, how could I get more involved in, in what I was interested in and just got super interested in photography. Um, and I was quite lucky in that, at that time, it was a bit easier to get work published because there wasn't as many photographers doing it. And I had enough disposable income to be able to get the equipment to to kind of get the quality that they wanted as well. So I got a few photos published in some magazines and kind of the very early online stuff at the time there as well. And then I moved to Switzerland uh, in 2013. And... I kind of thought I wouldn't that would be the end of the photography because I moved to this small alpine village um which is very small its population is less than 2000 people and it's quite away from you know things that are happening and I thought oh maybe that's probably the end of photography but actually the opposite happened and I ended up shooting more photography than I ever shot and I started working on long term projects and I opened a non-profit gallery here with some friends in the village and I've been, yeah, working on those projects, publishing small zines, putting stuff online, getting some small commissions and it's just gone more and more and more. And I'm, I'm going to photo festivals and portfolio reviews. I try to get to them most years, but last couple of years, obviously it's been difficult. And what I recently did is I uploaded a lot of my, current and previous projects to my website so a lot of it hadn't been online for a long time i mean i had a Flickr account a long time ago and i started using instagram just to kind of blog the odd photo here and there but i never really put work online um which i guess we'll get to the reasons for <laughs> that's super interesting uh, also seeing okay you expected it to be the end of your photography journey and then it uh, yeah it turns around and you basically cre helps create an environment that encourages you to to shoot more and, and publish um, and of course as always we're talking um, cameras i'm super interested in the kind of gear that you brought uh, for today so what is the first camera that you have yeah sure so the first camera i have is a Hasselblad it's a V-series body. So you've probably seen lots and lots of these. Um, 
on videos and blogs and Instagram. There's quite a big trend now on Instagram of seeing, you know, the shooting down the the waist level finder and seeing what you see. Um, and this this one's kind of interesting because it, it looks like every other V series Hasselblad camera that you see. Um, but what makes this one a bit different is it's one of the 200 series. So it has actually electronic controls built into the body. Now, the reason why I picked up this particular camera was because at the time I was, when I bought this camera, or at least the version I had before this, which again, we'll get to is I was shooting a lot of skateboarding at the time. So in, in the early two thousands, so 2000, when I got into it, so 2001, two, everybody, every skate photographer was shooting medium format which is kind of crazy because you're out there pointing this at flying pieces of wood and metal and it's you know not a cheap camera but the reason they were doing that is because obviously the i mean the quality of the the film size right six by six and also you could get a a flash sync of one over 500 so you could get a really nice sharp skater in the frame but the reason i bought this particular model uh, two or two hundred series is because it has a a focal plane shutter in the body. So what's what makes one of the reasons this is different to the the, the five hundred series is the the shutter speed can go up to one over two thousand. And when I was shooting skateboard skateboarding, I needed to freeze action. So one over five hundred is you can shoot skateboarding, but you're kind of limited to what tricks you can shoot. So you can't really shoot flip tricks, and you can't really shoot fast moving action. So I, I ended up picking up one of these in 2007. Uh, what I did at the time, when I first got into it, I had a Yashica D, I think it was, a TLR. And then I I moved on to a Bronica, a Bronica SQ, SQAI, I think it was. And I really enjoyed shooting with them. But what I really didn't like was using external lights. So at, at the time, everybody was shooting medium format to shoot skate photos and BMX photos and stuff like that. But they were using external lights. And I dislike that because it's it's an absolute hassle. So you have to set up all these external lights and they're really, they're really temperamental and you know they get knocked over and then the radio transmitters don't work. And and I end I, I most of the photos I liked was natural light, black and white, really simple skate photos. And I ended up doing some research and discovered these cameras. Um, and what what is also interesting about these 200 series cameras is they do, like I said, they have electronic controls. So there's actually a meter in the body, which allows you to, you know, walk around without an external light meter. Um, and it's extremely accurate. I think I put I've put probably I don't know five six thousand frames of film through one of these bodies. I've never had a bad exposure. It's it's crazy how accurate the meter is. And one of the really cool things as well is the the mirror actually has an instant mirror return. So if I it sounds a little bit different to the 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 the, the known kind of clomp of the five hundred series. It's it's got the instant mirror return, which gives it it's kind of there and back again. And that was really good for shooting action because when you're shooting skateboarding or whatever, you you shoot the the shutter and the mirror blacks out and you were never quite sure if you timed it right and you wouldn't obviously know that until you got the film back but with the instant mirror return you you had a better idea as yeah i got the trick or no i was totally off um so yeah th these are kind of interesting cameras because you don't really see these models so much on youtube um hasselblad they release them in I think the first ones came out in the early 90s, so 92, I think, 93. And at the time, they were very, very expensive because they were trying to modernize the V-series by putting in, you know, light metering and the, the focal plane shutter allowed you to use um, special lenses. So there's like the 110 millimeter F2, which is a very fast lens for medium format. And they kind of went on with that for about, 10 years before they they discontinued them and then they moved on to the H series because they couldn't they tried to modernize them but they couldn't 
put alt auto focus in and it was a bit kind of difficult for them to retrofit this kind of form factor to ha have all of the super modern features in there and um, so you don't they didn't make that many of them and i think what tends to happen is people that have them tend to hold on to them because they're i mean they're, they're fantastic you know walk around cameras you don't need a lot of the the external things you tend to associate with medium format film, you know, you don't need a light meter. Um, you can use it as a, it's quite quick, a quite quick camera to use. You know, it's not, it doesn't slow you down as much as a, as one without a meter and that kind of thing would do. Um, and the unfortunate thing about these now is they're even harder to get hold of because like a lot of the gear, the the prices have just skyrocketed, which is, you know, unfortunate. And they're becoming increasingly difficult to to get serviced and maintained. Because a lot of the service um places won't touch them because of these electronic mm -hmm. controls. And the focal plane shutter is very it's uh mm -hmm. it's kind of a you can probably see it if I show the camera there. You can see basically it's got this cloth shutter in the back. And, you know, that's that's quite a delicate piece of fabric and it's quite easy to damage that. So they, they got a reputation as of being a bit overpriced for what they were, the fact that they could, easy, could it be easily damaged and they needed service. And, yeah, so I did actually end up getting a second one of these. So this is actually my what was my backup camera at the time. So what happened is I bought a 203 FE, which is kind of the, not quite the top spec model. I, I got a very, very good deal on this, on that in 2011, I think it was. And I ended up using it, that camera with just one lens for several years for a project I was shooting, which was a Formula One races. And what I realized is as I started to travel to more races and spending more money to try and do this project, I realized that I needed a backup camera because if I were to fly out to Japan or Australia to go to a race and the camera jammed up or just stopped working, then I would have gone all that way and I didn't have a backup. So I ended up getting this, this particular one is a 202 FA, which is kind of a lower spec model. So it has a few restrictions. Um, you can't use specific lenses on it, and the it doesn't have the controls are built into the digital um, buttons rather than having a manual control on the lens. Um, but I bought it because I needed a backup, and it did actually come in use as a backup because my two hundred three did at one point. I think it was in China. It jammed up, and so it's you know it's it's kind of, it was necessary and I was glad I did it, but also because it allowed me to start using a second lens because at the time I had the 203 FE with one lens and it was quite interesting because I went to a, a portfolio review to show some of the early work from the projects. And one of the comments was a lot of the images start to look the same, right? They look a bit flat because you're using the same focal length and you, and you're shooting in the same way. So you start to get this very very similar look which can be that can be what you're aiming for but the comment was quite interesting because i thought about it and i was kind of like yeah i want to at the end of the project i need this, this the option to choose different types of images so having a second focal length was good because it opened up my eye a little bit as the project progressed so this is the this is this 80 mill 80 millimeter f2.8 which is probably one of the, the most common lens that you do get on these cameras. Um, and it did, I did end up, end up using this camera a lot more than my, the hundred the, the 203 with 110, because I think my eye kind of adapted and changed over the project, which I think is what tends to happen. Um, so yeah, what I did literally last week, two weeks ago is I sold my 203 FE, um, which was kind of hard to do. I'd had it for 12 years, yeah, over 10 years. And it had traveled the world with me and shot a lot of projects and, you know, a lot of fond memories of the camera, but I'm going to use those funds to move on to something else, maybe put that into the project to try and 
fund some prints and fund maybe a book. Uh, we'll see where that goes. But I still got this one and I probably will keep it for a while because I've I've always shot since, well, since 2003 to 2004, I've shot medium format square and I'm I'm a big fan of the square, the square format. And so I can't, I can't see myself getting rid of this one for a long time, if ever. Uh, yeah, it's a fun camera. I really love the story of, of how a backup camera that made a lot of sense, uh, as you just uh, explained, um, turned into that favorite camera and also kind of expanded um, your focal length range and how it now became your primary camera and you ended up selling something. And I can, I can feel it in your voice how much that uh, <laughs> was probably painful to, to pass it on. And yet I also like your perspective of saying, hey, I can use the funds to actually invest into that project um, that it helped create in the first place. Um, and I really like that that gear become can become so much more and really affect the photography in terms of the project funds um, as well and not just be replaced with different gear um, as we often do, right? Yeah. Um, really nice. Um, um, Regarding that project, um, this is also what, what really drew my attention. Um, the, the Formula Non project, as you call it, could you shed some more light on that? Um, mm, sure, yeah. So I've always kind of been into Formula One. I kind of grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, when it was quite easy to, to see it on TV in the UK. It was on every Sunday on the BBC, and you just on a Sunday afternoon when you're having like your Sunday lunch, it would just be there. So you, you, I think a lot of people of my age got into it through that and it's, you just get more and more interested in it as time goes by. And what happened is in 2009, I went to the Côte d'Azur. So my parents had friends that owned, they had a little mobile home at one of the many little Uh, towns on the Côte d'Azur on the south of France but this was two weeks after the Monaco race and basically you would as you would if you were a Formula One fan you would go to Monaco right no matter what time of year it is so I, I went to have a look at the place and have a look at the circuit which is basically just the streets right in Monaco and I found it super interesting because it was two weeks after the race so there was still a lot of the infrastructure in place for the, you know, the grandstands and the the big screens and the billboards and the, a lot of the tarpaulin. And I found it, visually, I found it super interesting because it's a lot of the things that you don't really see when you watch it on, well, now streaming or TV or whatever. But a lot of it's not, it's not glamorous, you know? F1 is sold as this kind of really glamorous fast moving sexy high high octane spot and actually when you go there it's it's kind of mundane all the details all the little things that you know you, they wouldn't show because it's the mundane background stuff and i i did i shot a few photos with the the camera i had not this one the the one that you know the original one just kind of as, as you would like walking around the circuit and i got when i got the film back a couple of weeks later I was like, well, there's a couple of images here, here that are kind of interesting because to me as a fan, it's some of the background minutiae that you you can see is kind of Formula One, but it's not got that obvious, you know, in your face um, cliche aspect that a lot of the photography and the media that you would expect. So, so what happened is I... I kind of put those to one side because this was 2009. And then in 2012, I was in Northern France for something totally unrelated to photography. But it just so happened that the timing was that at the end of that week, it was the Belgium Grand Prix. And I thought, well, I should go along because I'm, I'm literally a two hour drive from the Belgium Grand Prix and I can go there and just have a look and you know, experienced my first F1 race and I took my camera as you would. And in a way I was quite lucky in that it was a race where there was a huge pileup on the first corner and it took out one third of the field. 
And normally the Belgium, the Spa Grand Prix is super, super. It's one of the really exciting ones because it's a, an old fast track and there's a lot of overtaking and a lot of action. But a third of the field had been wiped out. So it became this quite boring procession of a race. And about 10 laps into the race, I was like super bored, you know, which is kind of interesting because you, you watch it on the TV and again, it's kind of like super exciting and super tense. And But when you're there in person, it's, it's kind of mundane and you, you, what's really interesting is how confusing it is you have no idea what's going on because you see this tiny little section of the race course and it's difficult if you can't see a big screen and you can't hear the commentary because of the noise of the cars you have no idea what's going on so i was i was kind of bored and i was confused and i had my camera so i figured well i'm just going to go walk around and shoot some photos and see what i get so i spent the rest of that day which is maybe four or five hours uh, walking around the circuit and just shooting some some photos a lot of it was actually photos of the fans because belgium is kind of interesting because it's out in a forest so there's not there's like the circuit and there's a forest so it's this kind of interesting disparity between you know this man-made thing and then nature so i shot i think it was three or four rolls of film um got those developed and two weeks later i thought this is kind of interesting again because it was it was f1 but not f1 and i had like maybe three or four images there i had a couple of images from monaco in 2009 and i thought well this is this is definitely a project this is definitely something that could be interesting so i spent the next seven years going to trying to get to races and shooting photos with the intention to do something with those photos. And I was quite lucky. And when I moved to Switzerland in 2013, that made it easier to get to a lot of the races because we were, we are literally three or four hours drive of some of the, the main circuits back then, you know, it's, it's a good six or seven circuits that are within, you can make it a weekend trip. Um, so I ended up going to a lot of the races in Europe and I built up, I built up enough work to be able to allow me to go to start going to portfolio reviews and showing the early work to, to mentors, to magazine photo editors, to online, um, photo platforms. Um, and the response has always been quite, quite enthusiastic because it's, it's kind of a, a look at something that we're very familiar with especially now with like netflix drive to survive and all of these you know f1 is really having a renaissance it kind of dipped in the 2000s and now with the streaming platforms it's becoming a lot more popular again and yeah the, the response was great and it's always kind of been work on this for a few more years and then do something with it and that's basically the point i'm at i'm at the point where i'm trying to do something with it and the kind of the dilemma I have at the moment is after 10 years, I have so much work that I could take it in many different directions. So I'm doing a few mentoring sessions to try and figure out where to take it and, you know, which images to use and how to sequence it and pairings and groupings and themes. And, and yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's taken a lot of my time and, I, it's, I kind of it's kind of absorbed me a bit but i'm making progress um and yeah hopefully in i don't know 18 months a year two years i might have something that is my kind of final edit that i can do something with and maybe release a book or an exhibition or maybe put some more work online because at the moment i have about i think 30 images and over the 10 years i shot two and a half thousand images and that's all shot on film. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's difficult to work with in a way because it's, it's all contact sheets and negatives and I've had to scan them all. And scanning is always fun and, you know, trying to get the colors right. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's absorbed a lot of my time the past, past 10 years, but it's been, it's been good fun. Super interesting to, to hear about that and the kind of journey that you had and, I can only imagine that a lot of photographers out there can somewhat relate to that. I feel like it's an extreme case, having built up a, a, a portfolio of um, work over 10 years, but um, 
many of us maybe started a long-term project at some point and then felt like it's yeah petering out or not really going in a direction that we wanted it to go and this is super interesting that you are now in a position where you can actually decide in which direction does it make most sense and i also like the contrast to your earliest work of okay yeah going out photographing in skate parks and uh, just friends and probably getting a couple of good decent shots and getting them pu published quite quickly mm. uh, in a completely different um yeah relation to what you just explained um i really like that um so uh, coming back a little bit to the gear if that's okay and also to switzerland mm, um, yeah of I, course. I, I also saw um that you own another Hasselblad in your system um or in your setup and um, that you also uh, like to shoot these typical mountainous Swiss Alp scenes that I find very beautiful, especially in black and white film. Could you shed some more light on, on your Hasselblad x band and what else? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the the famous or maybe infamous at this point Hasselblad x -Pan. Um This one has been through the wars a bit now. So I basically I picked this up Again, I was very lucky when I picked this up in 2015, I think it was, again, when the prices were rock bottom. Um, and I actually picked it up because I, ha I had an idea for a photo project where I wanted to, I thought about using the, the Hasselblad V-series cameras, but I realized it wouldn't be appropriate. Some of that was the technical reasons that I wouldn't be able to get decent shutter speeds and the frame would be too tight and it would draw too much attention to itself, which is what that camera kind of does because it's a very different way of shooting. And I realized this might be the ideal camera. So the idea I had was I, my day job is software engineering and I go to at the time three or four conferences a year. And I decided I wanted to try and shoot some photos there because what I realized is these, these, you know, these software conferences and this kind of, this niche is, it's a bit of a mystery if you don't work in it. I mean, we're all on the internet now and a lot of our lives are online and we never, apart from reading, you know, blog posts, we don't get a view of what's happening in these, in these ecosystems. And I was like, maybe I should shoot some photos of this um because it could be visually interesting but i think it's also it's kind of an important part of not necessarily social documentary but documenting what's going on in these places and i realized that the x pan would be an ideal camera because we often we would kind of refer to this as a panoramic camera because i mean it is a panoramic camera right but I prefer to think of it as a camera that gives you more context. So it, it gives you a frame where you can put a lot more context into it. Um, so I actually picked this camera up for that reason, for shooting at tech conferences, basically. And I, I've been working on that project again since 2015. And I've built up a body of work there that I'm, I don't think I'm finished shooting it yet. It'll be another three or four years before I, before I do that. But that was my reason for buying this camera and as i said i was very lucky i picked this up in 2015 when the prices were rock bottom um the prices of these cameras now is obscene i mean it's absolutely crazy where they've gone but of course the, the kind of the the stereotype with these cameras is you shoot landscapes with them right i mean it's a panoramic camera and you you stick it on a tripod and you know you're very precise with the composition and you get landscapes but i've never kind of been a fan of the that kind of photography um and it's i find it's not a great landscape camera in general because it's a rangefinder so you can't it's really difficult to use new, new uh, neutral dent density filters on it because it's a rangefinder the lenses are actually too wide i find for a lot of landscapes so i've have the 90 on here which is equivalent to about 50 on a 35 the 45 millimeter is equivalent to a 20, I don't know, 22, which is very wide. And then there's the 30, which is extremely wide. I think that's equivalent to 17 or something. And when I had the 45, I still do. I use it. The 45 I'm using for the, the tech conference project. 
it's great for that because I can be in a room like this and I can still get a lot of context. So it's it's a really good focal length. But as a landscape lens, it's too wide because it everything is too far away when you you shoot with that focal length. Um, so I never really thought about using it as a camera to shoot landscapes. And what happened is at the time I was shooting another project, I'm always shooting lots of projects with the local ski club. And I was using a little digital uh, Fuji rangefinder because it was ideal because we'd go up on the pistes and I'd be snowboarding and I didn't want a, a bulky camera and I didn't want a camera that I was afraid of damaging, you know, that would be irreplaceable or very difficult to get fixed like these are now. So one weekend I thought, well, I'll take the X-Pan up just to see what what how it performs on the mountain. You know, is it is it suitable for that kind of that environment? And literally the first or the second frame I shot with the X-Pan got a, a beautiful photo. And a lot of that was to do with the conditions on the mountain. So it was early morning and we had the, the Don Domini in the background and the sun was streaming down. And I had all of these racers doing their reconnaissance on a piece. So on the, on the print, you can see all the individual skiers and the, the composition just seemed to work really nicely because it gave you all of this context. Um, and that was actually with this 90 millimeter lens. So this, whenever I go shooting these panoramics in the Alps, I put this lens on with, with a, a deep orange filter and I shoot slow speed black and white pan F 50 film, um, from Ilford. And then I develop them in my sink at home and get them scanned and print them print them now myself um and it's become one of my most my best-selling projects at the gallery and one of the the one that people really respond to um and it, it's the combination of this camera and the kind of snowy landscapes works quite well uh, because when in most conditions i have everything kind of on a similar zone so i've got the the clouds zone eight nine i've got the snow at zone nine ten. I got this orange filter which darkens the sky, but because it's so bright, I can actually use this without having to use a tripod. So I can go around snowboarding it with it over my shoulder or under my coat, and I can get it out and shoot a photo without having to spend a lot of time, you know, getting the composition perfect and using filters and using a tripod and using low shutter speeds. Um, and yeah, so. It's it's an interesting camera, but I'm not sure if I would actually buy it now, given the prices. Um, it's gone, I think it's tripled, essentially, in the price that people are selling these for. And like, like the other Hasselblad, they're kind of difficult to get service now. There's the parts are running out. Um, if the electronics go in this, then it's pretty much game over. Because it's you know again it's got a meter in it the the film advance is electronic any of that goes and it's it's very difficult to get it replaced um, I it has been through the wars this one I've dropped it several times I broke the viewfinder when I was changing the lens one time on the on the glacier a skier a skier went past me and a lot of snow got inside of the uh, the mount so the the shutter curtain froze up um, I was quite lucky in that I realized quite quickly so I didn't try and use it i got it home let it warm up and it was fine again um i did have to get it serviced eventually so there's a chap in the netherlands that will service these cameras if it's a mechanical issue i don't think you can fix the electronic issues um but yeah it's again it's a fun camera to use and i think it's a fun camera to use if you don't use it for the things people expect you to use it for um and yeah the I th the fact that I live where I do means I can wait for the conditions to be right. I can wait for these cloud inversions. I can wait for the the good snow. So some of the photos I've shot for this project, I've only ever seen those lighting conditions for that photo. And I've been here for 10 years. You know, I've been shooting with this camera, that project for seven or eight years, six or seven years. So it's all about playing the waiting game for those for those images and not not trying to kind of rush and get something you know that you're maybe not quite happy with 
you know, you wait a little bit longer and you get a, a better image. So this is super interesting about the Hasselblad. And I know that you also have uh, significantly larger formats. So you also brought a 4x5 inch Toyo field, right? Mm. Yeah, so 4x5. Um, I thought about using a large format camera for a long time because, I mean, there's quite a few reasons to do it, but this is a totally different approach, right? I mean, this is definitely slowing down. We, you know, we often, I think when we're using analog photography, we often say that one of the reasons is that it slows you down. And I think that 35 millimeter and medium format, it, a little bit perhaps, but not so much, but this really slows you down because I mean, it literally takes you five minutes to set the thing up and you have to put it on a tripod and you have to be very rigorous because it's easy to make a mistake. You know, you, you forget to do something, you forget to put the standard right or lock something in place and you make a mistake and you don't find out until you develop the film often, which it can be frustrating. So I, I thought long and hard about getting into this and I never, I think the reason I didn't do it earlier is I didn't have an idea of what I was going to shoot with large format. Cause what I find I think with large format is it's a totally different approach in that you you have an idea for what you want, an, an image you want to shoot, and you go and shoot it. It's not a camera that you really take out with you and go and look for photos so much. You might do that a little bit, but you have a you have an idea of what you're looking for because you're having to carry so much equipment. You know that this alone is I don't know two kilos, maybe two and a half kilos, and then a good sturdy tripod is another four or five kilos, and then you start adding the lenses. You know this this is a one. 50 this is like the standard focal length on four by five and this is you know a big thing and well and this is a, one of the smaller ones and it's still you know this chunky thing so i thought long and hard about doing it and i picked one up at the end of 2017 um because my cousin actually was selling his kit so he's a photographer as well and he was getting out of all the film stuff and he had this and he said, do you want to try it out and see how it goes? I was like, sure, I know I'm probably going to end up buying it, but yeah, I'll try it out and see how it goes. And I still didn't have an idea of what I was going to use it for. Um, so I was, what I spent some time doing is figuring out, is it, is it viable in, in my approach? You know, could I take it to Formula One races? Could I take it up the mountain? You know, could I shoot? the style of photos or the kind of projects I shoot with it. And to an extent, yes. So I did actually take this to some Formula One races. Um, and this definitely attracts a lot of attention when you're setting it up. Um, people do ask, is that a Hasselblad, you know, which seems to happen with large format cameras, but <laughs> I guess they don't know cameras. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I started using it and figuring out what can I do with it? Like what, what kind of projects could I shoot with it? And could I introduce it into other, into other projects? And then I did take it to a few formula one races. I took it to, I took it to Monaco. I took it to Silverstone. I took it to Belgium and that was it. I think that was it. I shot about a hundred frames in total with it. And I didn't really get any images that, I think I would use in the final project. And I think that's because the approach is so different, which means the photos end up looking so different and trying to kind of, trying to shoehorn, shoehorn those photos into an existing body of work is, is difficult. There might be one or two that I could use because if I crop them to a square, or I crop them in a way that, would fit they don't look too different so the, the the images with large format tend to look very formal uh which is kind of hard to explain to anybody that's watching that doesn't kind of know photography composition in a way so i i mean they're very they're very considered and everything all the lines are straight and the composition is often very very precise 
Um, all the items in the frame are very organized in the way that you want them. There's, it lacks the spontaneity that the other formats give you. Um, so if you're shooting a specific project and it has a particular look, trying to add a different format with a totally different approach it can it can be a big i mean it could be a good thing to break up the flow of a project you know to suddenly have this image which looks very different um but trying to kind of trying to shoehorn it in because i have it is i realized was not was not going to work so what i've started to do is to look at other projects to use it for um so i've been shooting i've been shooting a number of projects here in the village of the sporting events and what I'm using this camera. So one of the reasons I kind of got attracted to this camera was for the movements, because obviously what we can do is we can, we can, if I set the camera up a little bit, you know, we have all of these, these movements that we can do. And often we're using those to correct some of the problems we have with perspective when we're shooting with other cameras. Cause you know, the, the one everybody's probably aware of is when you, if you point your camera up at some buildings, when you look at the final image, it looks like the buildings are falling over. You know, we they're not falling over. And when we're walking around, our brain is obviously very good at correcting that perspective. But when you look at an image, it looks like they're falling over. And with this camera, we can adjust all of the, you know, the the front standard and the back standard. And we we have all of, the, have all of these things to to kind of fix that. So that's what I mean by it being more formal. You know, we can we can be very, very precise about getting the, the verticals completely straight, or we can fix issues with the focus field. You know, we can get everything in focus from the front to the back. So we don't have this medium format look, you know, where often there's a small depth of field. So only one thing is in focus in the frame. Um, so, and if you're shooting a particular type of photography, you might want everything to be in focus or you might want the other extreme. So with this camera, you can go from one extreme to the other. So I've been using it in the village here to shoot a lot of the sporting events. So in the summer, there's a lot of bike races. They have the World Cup of Climbing here. They have uh, some uh, ultra marathons on the on the pistes where the runners are doing 60 kilometer um races and things and that's the kind of project i've been using it for because i use the movements to go to the other extreme so i i'm throwing everything out of focus so i have images of for example the tour de france came through the village last july and i went i walked down to one of the areas where they would go past and i set the camera up and I threw everything out of focus apart from one small section where I knew that the the cyclists would be. And the point of the project is all of these are sporting events that involve movement, and I'm using the movements on the camera. So there's kind of that link there in a way. Um, and I only really started that. Uh, I started that pre-COVID, so I actually did take this camera up on the piece. It's actually, despite, I mean, it, it's quite big there but it folds up quite nicely into as you saw into quite a compact relatively compact um, body and what i can do is i can i can put it in my backpack and i can take a small lightweight tripod and i can get to places on my snowboard and then set the camera up so i, I shot a photo of there was the youth olympics in 2020 in the village and i shot a few photos of the ski cross um and again, I, I use the movements to throw things out of focus. And that was the first photo. So it was one of those moments where it was like, well, there's the Olympics are happening in the village or the youth Olympics are happening. And I should probably go shoot a photo of that because it's interesting to do that, but maybe I could use it in the gallery. Um, so I'll shoot a photo and I shot one photo and then COVID hit. So there was no sporting events for two years, give or take. But I had this photo and it's kind of like, well, I know that they have sporting events usually. So can I shoot a series of photos in this kind of style? So they're all black and white, four by five, things in focus, things not in focus. And that's what I've been working on primarily with this camera. Um, I have been using it for 
kind of other random things as well. Um, but like I say, it's not the approach is so different with this camera in that you really have to be you kind of almost picture the the final image in your head and then you go out and achieve that image and you get often you get very close to what your vision is it's uh, it's pre-visualization i guess would be the the way to say you use this camera because it takes you know it, it takes a good five minutes ten minutes to say up correctly and check everything's there and then you know you, you kind of adjust the composition very very minutely and then you often depending on what you're shooting you're waiting for the right moment you know for the light to be right for the elements in the frame to be right and it can take you it can take you half an hour to shoot a photo and what i what i find super interesting about this camera is often you go through all of that and you don't shoot a photo so you spend all this time you have this idea in your head and it doesn't meet your expectation when you're looking on the ground glass it's it just the composition isn't right or the light isn't right and you don't take a photo so the photo only exists in your head so you end up building this album of photos that you've never taken and it only exists in your head and i i find that's what i find super interesting about this camera all the photos i haven't taken but i can see mm. in my head um and that alone is its own project, you know, the photos I haven't taken. Um, so it's it's such a different approach. And it, and again, one of the, the follies of using this camera is it has become expensive. The cameras themselves are actually, they're very reasonably priced. They're, I mean, they're literally just a light type box. You know, you can you could build one of these yourselves with two planks of wood and a drill and a bit of cloth. And you just need to put a lens on one end and... A piece of film on the other so you can do it very easily but the film itself has become as a lot of the film has become it's become expensive or discontinued so what the film i primarily shoot fuji across with with this camera and i saw it coming so in 2000 and shortly after buying this camera and realizing yeah i want to use it i like it i like the approach i'm going to keep it I knew that Fuji were going to discontinue this stuff. I could I could see the writing on the wall for it. So I bought, I think it was 15 boxes. Um, and I still have, I think, 10 boxes in my freezer. It's all expired in 2019, but it should be good. It's in the freezer. So yeah, it's if I wanted to, why well, I couldn't buy this now, even if I wanted to, I'd have to get some expired stuff off eBay or wherever. But in general, it's become it's become very expensive. And I think that's also a reason why you don't shoot photos. You can like this, this photo is gonna, it's gonna cost me, you know, five francs, or if it's a color shoot, if it's a color image, it's gonna cost me 15 francs because I have to get developed. And I'm not quite happy with it. So I'm not gonna take it. And it's only gonna exist here. And I'll come back maybe at some other point and maybe I'll, I'll shoot it at that time. So the, the long term, approach with this camera is pre-visualizing it and then getting the photo eventually achieving what you want to achieve eventually and that might take you know it could take a few weeks it could take a number of years so it's 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 a totally different approach but one i i, I kind of like in a way that's that's a beautiful metaphor as well um, what you mentioned like the collection or body of work that you have in your head of photos never taken <laughs> And uh, yeah, I can also imagine it's, it must be quite exciting to be around uh, on the slopes with a snowboard and have all that expensive gear in your backpack, <laughs> <laughs> knowing that it's not a good idea to, to, to fall. Um, and also to, to get somewhere, um, probably sometimes it's, it's challenging to get to a certain spot and then setting everything up as you described and just leaving without having taken a single shot. Um, and also to consider that an important and essential part of photography. Yeah. Um, now I would be interested in um, your your serial work. You mentioned that a little bit about the Formula Non, um, but um, the way I see your work on your website and the way you present it, it's a lot about common themes or, as you already touched on, sticking to a certain film stock and cameras or a certain gear setup to make it look also consistent. Um, how do you approach these kinds of serial work and, and what goes into it in terms of thinking, um, conceptual work and so on? I would be super curious about that. Hmm. Yeah, so 
I think a lot of it starts from often a single image. I mean, I think the common theme bef- it, 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 that crosses all of my projects is it's either something that interests me or it's something I'm involved in. Involved in. And I don't. That's, that's in no way unique. I mean, we. I think we generally shoot photos of things we're interested in or things we're involved in. Um, but often for me, it starts out as a single one or two images. So, for example, like I said, with the Formula Non project, it was, oh, I'm just here in Monaco, I'll shoot some photos. And then realizing when I get the film back, this has potential. And with the, the ski club work, it was, I live here and a colleague whose daughters were in the ski club at the time said, oh, why don't you come with us? We're going to another resort that's at the other side of the valley because the ski races happen in all the different resorts. And for, for me, it was kind of like, well, that sounds kind of cool because I, I get to go to a ski resort that I've not been to before. And I'll shoot some photos. And if if something comes up, great. If not, that's fine. I get to snowboard somewhere I've not been before. But I take the, you know, I take one camera along with me just to see what what's there and see if there is potential. But I don't I don't really decide before I've started that. I'm going to shoot a photo project on this, or I'm going to shoot a photo project here, or I want to shoot a photo of this. It's it's more about I take a camera with me and I'll shoot a few photos and then that might turn into a long-term project. Um, so I have a lot of projects that I have kind of abandoned in a way. I've shot a few images. I've explored it a little bit and then it's been a case of i don't find this interesting enough or it's not it's not interesting enough for me to carry on with it or i don't think it's worth the effort in a way um and a lot of that can be down to how easy or difficult it is to shoot photos so the formula non-project has been interesting in that I'm constrained in what I can do and where I can go. If you want to get photos of Formula One in the way that most photos we think of, it's super difficult because you're going to be sat in the grandstands with one viewpoint and you're restricted by your equipment. So you need to bring more equipment, so more lenses to be able to shoot you know, different types of photos. If you want to really get into it, then you need to get accreditation. And to do that in F1 is super, super difficult. It's beyond reach of most people. You need to get to, you need to go to, I think, at least 16 races in the previous year. And you need to have had at least 200 images published either online or in, on print. Or you need to be a staff photographer for a, a magazine that then puts you forward for accreditation. So the barrier to entry to do it as you think it's done is super, super high. So that's a massive constraint for anybody that wants to shoot that particular subject. So my approach was, well, I'm just going to take a camera and I'm going to go all the places that the other photographers are not going. I'm going to shoot photos of things they're not shooting photos of. And I'm going to see if there's enough there to make it interesting and i think it is because it's it's a subject in the way that we've not we don't really see it so i think that's one of the kind of common threads through the projects i shoot in that it's images of things but not in the way you maybe expect to see them so i shot a lot of photo when i first arrived in switzerland i arrived in the summer the midsummer so it was august early august and the first weekend i went for a walk up here on the pistes and obviously this is in summer so it's all green pistes but you still have all of this lift infrastructure there so this the, the drag lifts and the, the magic carpets and the chair lifts and the telecabine and generally you only ever see images of those in the ski season right you see people on the chairlift and you see skiers and it's all this snowy landscape and then to see it out of context that you, you ever see it it's kind of like it's weird but also super interesting so i ended up shooting a series of photos of the ski lifts the ski infrastructure but only in the summer 
because it has this weird context and some of it's almost like some of it you don't quite understand what it is like the snow cannons look very strange in when they're in a you know in a in, in a meadow in the summer and it's just this metal structure in the middle of a hill so that's kind of what i found interesting there um and i think also it's that aspect of it taking a bit of time to build up a body of work so not not trying to do too much too quickly and not trying to have a paradox of choice so i only generally take one camera and one lens with me so i don't have this dilemma of wow well, do i shoot it on a panoramic do i shoot it with four by five uh do i use a longer lens do i just it's you constrain it's again it's constraining yourself to not having to think about the technicalities you know you, you're thinking more about the final image and you kind of know what it's going to look like because you're using the same camera through a project. You, you've got, like I said, you've got, I know roughly what it's going to look like and I, I know what my camera can do. And I know I don't have this issue of, well, I'm going to use a different film or I'm going to, I'm going to use a zoom lens or, you know, I'm going to have to carry three different cameras because I'm not sure what I want to shoot. So if you constrain yourself in that way, you're thinking more about the project than the technicalities. And taking that time to do that allows you, I think, to build up a body of work that has a cohesive, a cohesive look and a cohesive style to it. Um, and that makes, I think, the editing process a bit easier. Um, and it can take a long time to do this. I mean, some of the, like say the projects I've been working, some of them are, I sometimes get the occasional short commission as some projects I've done in a few weeks, and then the longest one is this Formula Non project, which is in its 14th year, if we start from 2009. But I'm quite lucky in that I make my living as a software engineer, so I have the ability to not feel that I have to compromise what I, shoot, what I want to shoot in order to kind of make my living that way. Um, and that gives me the freedom to take my time with this and explore different approaches um, and not be in a rush to get the work out there to kind of let it let it percolate and let the let the direction be clearer and and then do something with it that sounds really interesting and i'm immediately inspired just listening to you to if i understood it correctly to have this set of projects that you're working on at the same time and then basically decide depending on maybe the light conditions and what you're up to that particular day which one camera you take in order to maybe contribute to that project but without forcing it without rushing it and so on and uh yeah that's that's super inspiring um especially in today's day and age where everyone's like oh uh, getting that perfect shot that everyone else got to yeah post it on instagram or something instead taking a completely different approach and slowing down is as i understand it and uh, put the time effort and patience into a project to really make it stand out in the long run um yeah i, yeah, I really it's... like that I think it's interesting in that we've we for a long time we've had this kind of you know was it Warhol I think he was misquoted as saying everybody gets their fifteen minutes, but I think a lot of social media has convinced people that it only takes fifteen minutes to get that fifteen minutes, and I think that's that's a wrong way to approach it because you're not building up a body of work, you're not showing what else you can do um and you're kind of you're shoeboxing yourself or pigeonholing yourself into one particular you know subject or style or approach and i think that can in the long term that can be that can be a problem if you if you actually want to if you want to actually make a living of out of photography you know you you're gonna get burned out if you're always wanted to be sh sh you know you're always employed to shoot a particular style of photography or a particular a lot of photographers make a very good living doing that and they're not you know they don't feel the need to 
put their work out there on social media on me social media you know there's a lot of there's a lot of commercial photographers and fine art photographers and sports photographers that have been doing this for quite a long time and they don't they don't feel the need to join the social media treadmill of having mm -hmm. to push work out there um and i think it's partly because a lot of them have come from a background that was pre social media or you know pre uploading everything all at once um pre you know turning it around in five minutes and so they're maybe a bit older and a bit you know more knowledgeable on that aspect of it but yeah i think i think the danger with these platforms is that they give people the expectation that they can have it all very quickly and i think with photography that's not that's not the case um you i mean you can always get lucky you can always something can go viral but do you really want that do you want to become known for only shooting a particular type of image you know it's i have in in the projects i've been working on i have had times when i got burned out i mean i got burned out on the formula one project in 2017 out of 16 17 i've been going to race i managed to get three or four races that year and in the in the fourth race i just started to get a bit burned out because i've been doing it at that point for six years and you have this dilemma you need this moment where you you feel like is this ever going to end you know i'm shooting these images and i'm not doing anything with them yet but you have to you know you have to look after the the long term you know the short term will take take care of itself you just have to look after the long term and take a step back and you know do something else for a little bit and then come back to it and see if the passion is is still there and speaking of that and that would be my last question to you um as an artist and as a photographer um, you mentioned you have a day job but as an artist and photographer what do you aspire to it's a difficult question <laughs> um i mean i think if i look at the reasons why i got into photography in the first place it was a lot of it was a reason to travel so when i was skateboarding i would travel to events around the country in the uk and i would go to places i'd not been to before and that was back then that was a big reason to to be a photographer and i think it's also in the projects i'm shooting now or have been shooting it's also a reason to do it so the formula one work obviously i traveled to races around europe around parts of the world and i'm seeing new places i'm meeting new people um when i go to festivals and portfolio reviews it's again a reason to travel to see new people to see new places and i think the main aspiration is to keep on shooting things that interest me and not be constrained by an expectation on a particular approach so i've had in the last three or four years i've had some short commissions so i do get asked occasionally in the village and elsewhere to to shoot photos of a particular event um and i find that i find that difficult because there's an expectation about the type of image that the client wants and that's that's a constraint that i don't like um so being free to shoot what interests me in a way that interests me i think is a good aspiration and i kind of i prefer to work on the projects and see where they go um see where they take me visually but also geographically and i think a recent aspiration is to print more of my work so i've recently invested in print facilities so i bought myself a large format printer and I'm printing more of my work now um, to sell online and to sell in the gallery and learning more about that process. Because I used to do a lot of darkroom printing back when I was in the UK, but I couldn't, here in Switzerland, I couldn't, I don't have the room to set myself up a, a wet darkroom. And I found that the hybrid flow of 
pr- shooting film, scanning the negatives, and then printing digitally is, I much prefer that um, because the control is there, um, but also you still got that, you still got the the approach in that the cameras inform your approach. And then the final stage of actually getting a print done is it's a bit easier um, and a bit, it feels like less of a chore printing digitally. Um, I used to enjoy working in the dark room, but when I'm having to produce work to sell in the gallery, I, I couldn't do that with a wet dark room because the images, you know, the, 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 the prints have a specific look and recreating that time after time in a wet dark room would be, would be very difficult. Um, especially with a panoramic camera, um, where you've got so much more that you're, you're having to dodge and burn and work with. And yeah, so that's, that's a big aspiration, printing more work as well. And also to get the work out there into the world and to kind of leave a little bit of culture behind is I think a good aspiration to, to aim for. Great. And I hope this, this video will help a little bit in this endeavor <laughs> in spreading the word about your fantastic uh, work. Um, so thank you very much for your time um, this morning. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best and good luck with the ongoing projects. I'm super curious to see where they uh, develop. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Max. Thank you. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Cameras and my conversation with Lee A. Johnson. As you could see, a fantastic photographer working on a couple of really interesting long-term projects. And it's also interesting to not just listen to his thoughts about his gear, but also his approach to photography. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to like it and maybe even share it with your friends. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Jules, Greg and I really appreciate each and every subscriber coming our way. So thanks for watching. I hope to see you soon. Bye.